and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast. I'm Scott Miller, your host and interviewer each week where we have the privilege every week to interview some of the biggest thought leaders in the world. Some weeks they are former political officials. Perhaps they are best-selling authors, business titans, thought leaders. In some cases, they are military heroes. And sometimes they are not a household name where someone has done some research or perhaps they've experienced and survived an unspeakable trauma. And through their recovery, they have lessons to teach us. And so this podcast has now become the world's largest weekly leadership podcast, not because of me, but because of the great guests that choose to come on and invest their time in each of you. And today we have one of my lifelong heroes. It is fair to say that this person uh, I'm a fanboy of. I hope to write about her in the 10-volume series that I have from HarperCollins. You may know that by now... Every year, I write a new book called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds. Volume 1 and Volume 2 are out, kind of the chicken soup for Leadership Soul, where each year, with the permission of 30 guests, I highlight them and write a story about one transformational insight they share on our program. Because oftentimes, the great stuff is on the cutting room floor, right? It's in the green room beforehand or perhaps afterhand. And with their permission, I pick 30 people. would love to have you pick up a copy of Master Mentors, available both in print, digital, audio, and now a video book from Lit Video. You can watch the book in 40 minutes as well. And today, our guest is one of my lifelong heroes. Her name is Anna Quindlin. She is the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, columnist, and author. She's written do- nearly two dozen books, both in the, in the fiction and nonfiction world. One of my all-time favorite books, which has been on this set from day one, is this book that has sold a million-plus copies. Now, we tend to throw these terms around best-selling author, million copies, Pulitzer Prize, but this woman is legit. One of her books that's my favorite is A Short Guide to a Happy Life. And I believe that there's a great story behind this book in terms of it coming to fruition for a commencement speech that was invited at Villanova that later happened but didn't happen in its right time. And we'll ask Anna perhaps if she'll share that story and other musings from her own life as a journalist, as a mother, as a spouse, and now as a, an influencer in terms of how to make the most of your life. Anna Quinlan, welcome to On Leadership. Thanks, Scott. It's so good to be here with you. And thanks for those kind words. Well, it's very true. I told you off air, I've been a fanboy for decades. You wrote a column in Newsweek magazine for a decade in the late 90s into the 2000s, where every week you altered with, uh, alternated with George Will, the famous political conservative commentator. You both uh, offered different perspectives on uh, uh, issues of the time and issues of gravity and weight in our life. And I looked every Friday forward to receiving in print my Newsweek read every column you ever wrote. I'm not a fiction reader. I don't read novels, but of all the novels that I have read, two or three of them are yours. And a top 10 book, I don't say that lightly. You can see I read, I've read a few books in my day. One of my top 10 favorite books is your book, A Short Life, Short Guide to a Happy Life. Anna, would you take, before we get into the book and other musings, would you take a couple of minutes and reorient yourself to our listeners and viewers on uh, how you won a Pulitzer for your column in the New York Times, why you like to write, kind of how you came to On Leadership today, and we'll talk a bit about some of the musings of this book in particular. Well, you know, I was thinking about talking to you, Scott, and because we were talking about leadership, leadership as opposed to management, because they're for two very different things, I started to think about my dad. My dad was a management consultant, and he really marinated me in management theory. And one of the people that he really esteemed was the management guru, W. Edwards Deming. Um, And one of Deming's, I think, most important directives in terms of leadership was drive out fear. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought that that applies to almost everything that when you approach things as fearlessly as possible, you tend to do the right thing. Every time I sit down at the computer to write, I'm afraid. Um, I'm afraid it's not gonna be good. I'm afraid it's not gonna be as good as the last time. I'm afraid nobody's gonna read it. I'm afraid my editor's gonna hate it. And driving out that fear is what enables me to write. And I think during the times when I've been in leadership positions, driving out fear not only in the people I was working with, 
letting them know that I was open to being challenged, to thinking in a different way about what I was approaching. That was critical, but driving out my own fear of giving up that kind of power and control was critical as well. So I thought back to my father having led me down that path and thought from child rearing to public speaking, to writing, to trying to be a leader, driving out fear in others and in myself has been critical um, to being successful. It's such a great reminder that most of our lives are driven by fear. Most of our unfulfilled dreams, relationships, successes are because of fear. And I love your ideology around how a leader's job is to confront fear, talk about it, embrace it, move through it. Absolutely. I mean, look, you can manage people day to day. You can say, okay, today we're going to do this, and this week we're going to do that. But if you get past your own fear and, and say, you know, I've got this broad vision for where we might go over time. What do you think? What's your input on this? It can make all the difference. We've, it's become a cliche, obviously, in management theory, thinking outside the box. But the truth of the matter is most people don't do it because the box is really comfortable, right? It has sides, you know where you are. And I really think you have to push past that sense of, uh-oh, we've never done it that way before. Um, to get to the point where not only can you be really generative, but you can make the people that you're with, that you're working with, feel like they're doing something that they're passionate about and that's really exciting. Anna, we've interviewed the biggest authors of our generation on this podcast. It's been a blessing and it's been humbling. And we throw around terms like best-selling author and Pulitzer Prize winning and a million copies and three million copies. Uh, but you did, in fact, win a Pulitzer Prize. You are, in fact, a number one New York Times best-selling author. You are a writer who writes short form and long form. You write form fiction and nonfiction and, and, and novels. This book, which is only 50 pages, and half of them are photographs that you give permission to. This book has sold over a million copies. Will you share with us how this book originally manifested at Villanova, this book called A Short Guide to a Happy Life? Well, it's, it's both a sad story and, um, and essentially at the end, kind of a triumphant one. And it's funny, I was just reprising it with my cousin, Tom Quinlan, who's on the board at Villanova. Um, I'm from a big Philadelphia Villanova family. Um, my uncle Jack Quinlan, who was the CFO at DuPont, um, was chair of the board at Villanova as well. And when he and Father Dobbin, who was the president, asked me to give the commencement speech, I told them that although I am a Catholic, um, the hierarchy has had um, uh, a number of problems with me, um, ranging from my views on um, legal abortion to the ordination of women and um, the rights of gay men and lesbians. I mean, we sort of covered the waterfront and that therefore, it was probably unwise to ask me to give the commencement speech, but both of them really felt like it was the right thing and, and Catholic colleges and universities convince themselves that they're, that they have absolute rights of free speech. And so we went ahead. I was delighted to be the third member of my family who was going to get an honorary degree from Villanova after my great uncle Jim and my uncle Jack. And then, um, my dad called me one Saturday morning and said, you need to know that there's been a huge uproar about this, that um, there are going to be demonstrators at the commencement, um, that uh, there's a small group of students who intend to turn their back, and that the cardinal has gotten involved. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. Here's the thing. If I had been invited to give a speech at Villanova as a freestanding speech, I would have said, well, that's just too bad, but I'm going and I'm talking. But I had been asked to give the commencement speech. And while commencement speakers are somewhat important, the most important people at any graduation, at any commencement, 
are the graduates? And I felt like um, what was going to ensue from my presence would materially affect in a negative way their experience of their graduation. So um, I wrote a letter, faxed it over. This was before we so more commonly used email and said, it was a great honor, but I'm stepping down. Um, and there was a fair amount of publicity that followed that. And then about a week later, I got a um, an email from a young woman who said, look, you don't know me. I'm a member of the graduating class. I'm deeply disappointed that you're not going to be the speaker. Do you have any idea what you would have said? And I wrote back and said, well, actually, yeah, I'd already written the speech. So I sent it to her and thought, well, that was that. And then about a month or two later, one of my friends said, wow, that was a great speech you gave at Villanova. I said, I didn't give the speech at Villanova. I don't know. I just read the speech online. It's really good. And over six months, it started to be everywhere. And my editor said, look, you know, people really like this. Let's do it as a little book. And frankly, I think we all thought maybe it would sell. 10 or 15,000 copies, which would have been nice. And, um, and A Short Guide to a Happy Life came out 20 years ago, 21 years ago, and it has sold steadily ever since. And as you said, uh, I think it's about 1.7 million copies oh at this gosh. point. But, but the greatest excitement for me, Scott, is that sometimes someone will say to me, you know, I was at mass on Sunday and our pastor quoted from your book, A Short Guide to a Happy Life. And I think, well, you know, the church has a lot of moving parts to it. And at one end of this, I experienced one. And in another end, I'm experiencing another. It's a beautiful story. It's amazing this book is going to sell 2 million copies in the coming years. I think one of my favorite lines in the book that I'm going to misquote is you write this idea of, let's just face it, we have an embarrassment of riches. And I'd like you to kind of unpack that because there may be some people listening to this podcast or watching right now from anywhere in the world that may not feel like they have an embarrassment of riches. They might be Ukrainian and they've been forced out of their home through the Russian aggression. That might be someone that lost a child or like you lost their mother early in life and it's impacted literally everything you've written in your life. Give some context to what it means to ground yourself in an embarrassment of riches? Well, look, I'm keenly aware of the fact that all over the world, there are people who are going through things that I can't even imagine. I mean, you mentioned the Ukrainians or in countries throughout the world where there's incredible levels of um, sectarian violence or, or uh, climate um, changes, monsoons, droughts, that are leaving them holding starving children. I, uh, including here in the U.S.? Uh, including here in the U.S. Including, uh, I'm well aware of the fact that I live a really blessed life. But what I think I want to communicate there is that I know lots of people who have really blessed lives, who are prosperous, who have great kids, and they tend to focus on the negatives. I mean, one of the things, one of the areas where it's most powerful for me is around the issue of aging. Oh my goodness, the people who act like aging is this incredible curse. Well, I just turned 70 and I am happy to say that because what it means is I'm still alive. And I'm not only still alive, I'm, I'm still healthy, my kids are around, I see them all the time. I've got three grandchildren. Sure, I could focus on the fact that sometimes my knees make us sound like Rice Krispies. You know, that's, that's undeniable, or that there's a lot of gray in my hair, or that there are things that I could once do easily that now take a lot more effort. But the very fact, the very fact that I got up at five o'clock this morning to watch the, the, eclipse that led to the blood moon, I just stood up on the hill watching that moon get redder and redder and redder and thought, it's just such a privilege to be alive. 
Anna, you have had incomparable success in life, right? Um, no doubt you've had setbacks and failures and tragedies. You've raised three successful children. You've had, obviously, you know, um, 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 immeasurable literary success. You've earned a few dollars along the way. In many ways, you uh, would refer to yourself as maybe now an expert even in human nature. What, what are some of the things you've learned through all the roles in life? Philanthropist and entrepreneur and writer and columnist and journalist. What have you learned to be true about human nature that you need for us to be reminded of? Henry James, who wasn't exactly thought of as a warm fuzzy, although he was always thought of as a great novelist, once said three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. Um, what I found over the years as a leader, as a writer, as a teacher, as a mother, is that a little bit of kindness goes a long, long way. And I think that that's undeniable, that one of the things that's become so poisonous in our national discourse is that we've forgotten how to be kind to one another. And, and we've forgotten the humanity of the people we face. So we tar with a, a broad brush, a whole group of people. And then we meet one of those people who like us is a parent or like us is struggling with, with some medical condition or like us is, is living through tough times. And we suddenly go, oh, gee, you're just like me. I mean, that's that. one of the best things that ever happened to me as a human being is becoming a reporter. Um, I've, I've had many other incarnations. Um, I've been an editor. I am a novelist. Um, but, I mean, I think of myself first and foremost as a reporter. And the reason it was so important to me was because getting out there day after day, talking to people from all different walks of life, doing all kinds of different things in the city of New York, enabled me to see in the most indelible way that we are all more alike than we are different. And I think that's a thing in this country and maybe in the entire world that we've lost sight of over the last, uh, uh, over part of my lifetime, that we're all more alike than different. And I think that if you keep that in mind, especially when you're, when you're dealing with managing people, that we're all more alike than different and that a little kindness can go a long way, that's that's really, I, it sounds so simplistic, but that is really what I've learned. You know, we're taping this interview kind of in the midst of the holiday season in 2022. Uh, we've just come out of some midterm elections. We're headed into the new uh, political you know, sphere for the coming two years. For a decade, I mentioned that you authored a column in Newsweek magazine, at the time one of the most, if not the most popular news magazine in the world, and you alternated every week with the very famous conservative commentator, George Will, on one week, off one week. And I think it's a good illustration of how our, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year dinners are and Easter dinners are with family of, you know, fiercely divided politics and passions and, and rational and irrational fears and, 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 and um, topics. What advice would you give to all of us in a, in a maybe even irreparably, but certainly increasingly polarized political landscape around our dinner tables? What advice would you give to us about the value of civility and kindness and how do you listen and learn while still recognizing that we're all trying to influence, right? Whenever we open our mouths, we're often trying to influence others. Uh, what would you give us, what, what would you remind us of there? Oh, boy. If I came up with a good answer for that, I you would might sell one point seven million books. So some so, so. kind of <laughs> social genius, because I think that's really a tough one. I, I think that we're really in um, in a moment when 
political positions are seen as personal, personal failings, maybe personal, personal attributes, so that it doesn't, it doesn't any longer become about policy. It doesn't become about what you think we should do. It becomes about who I think you are. And that becomes so, so, so painful. Um, some of the most painful memories I have of my early relationship with my father um, was around the war in Vietnam. Um, my first vote for president in 1972 was for George McGovern. Um, and honestly, if I had it to do all over again, I'd still vote for George McGovern. So um, I, I, I do think, I do think these are hard conversations. I will also say that um, that my father changed his mind <laughs> about the war, and he changed his mind about some of the people um, that he'd supported. And I like to think that one of the reasons he changed his mind um, was because of conversations that we had. Um, together. I remember him calling me the morning after election day um, in 2008, and he said with a lot of emotion in his voice, baby, I never thought I'd see this day when a black man would be elected president and the Phillies would win the World Series. <laughs> and, and I remember just thinking, well, that's my dad, the Phillies and the, and the the lessons of history. <laughs> Anna, in many ways, the inspiration for this book, A Short Guide to a Happy Life, didn't just come out of your speech, or your commencement address to Villanova, which, I, by the way, happened the year later, did it not? You, you, were, you came to Villanova. No, I, I've, you didn't. No, I, I, Catholic, Catholic institutions and I have a very uneasy relationship, <laughs> and I've decided, I've decided to take, um, take the dis-ease um, out of their hands and, and just um, and stick to the secular. I love that phrase. I think the IRS and Scott Miller have a very uneasy relationship. <laughs> so uh, more on that later. But one of the genesis of your book was, of course, the passing of your mother. Your mother passed at the right. age of 40 from ovarian cancer. You were 19 years old. And I was, I was rereading this book a couple of nights ago for the fourth or fifth time. I was thinking about my oldest son, Thatcher. He's 12. He's named after one of my heroes, Margaret Thatcher. And he's not so far from 19, right? He'll be in college in five, six years or so. And I was thinking about what he would be like had his mother, my wife, pass at 19. Talk about the impact that that had on you and what you've learned about what is important in life from the passing of your mother at the age of 40, her age, her age of 40. Uh, it changed everything about me. I can scarcely imagine the person I would be if that hadn't happened. Although, frankly, if if I had to choose between becoming the person I am and having my mother um, live to a ripe old age, I would definitely choose the second. Um, I think what it taught me, my mother had a very ordinary life. Um, she was what we then called a housewife. And I am embarrassed now to say that although she had five children in 10 years um, and never had any household help, that I spent a lot of my youth wondering what she did all day. And now I know the answer to that question. But even though she had what you would consider a very ordinary life, I could tell at the end that she really wanted to hang on to it. And that communicated to me more vividly than anything else could that being alive, that having this life, that waking up every morning and having that day in front of you was something that you shouldn't take for granted. And, and I haven't ever since. Um, and the other thing is that it, it sort of set me apart from my peers when I was younger because a lot of the things that concerned them that they were worried about, that they obsessed over, seemed so foolish to me. I mean, imagine this. I take a year off of college and I go back and I've spent the last year, the year before, taking care of a dying woman and then taking care of her surviving children because I'm the oldest of five. 
And, you know, I'm surrounded by my friends who are great people, but they're all like, you know, am I going to get a B in this seminar course? And will I get into med school the first time out? And all of those things pale beside having walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And um, I, I just think it changed me so completely. And I also think there's a phenomenon that a woman named Hope Edelman has written very vividly about um, called motherless daughters. And I think that those of us whose mothers die when we're quite young, then set about to walk pretty large, to, to move pretty fast in the world. And I certainly think um, that that was, that was some of what I did. Um, I also think that when I was 31 and had my first child, I realized that what I was going to try to do for the rest of my life was to be as much like um, my mother in every way possible to my own children. That's a lovely tribute. What is your mom's name? Prudence Quinlan. Prudence Pantano Quinlan. That's a great, that's a great um, Pennsylvania name, is it not? <laughs> I, uh, I have, a, I have a new novel coming, I think, in May, although when they bring these things out, it's always a little bit squishy. And um, although I have uh, twice in the past um, dedicated books, um, either to her or to her and my father, uh, this is the last one that, that I will dedicate to her because it's very much about um, motherhood and loss. Anna, in our final moments, will you give us a short guide to a happy life? <laughs> um, um, I think happiness is a choice you make every single day. Um, even under difficult conditions, even when you're ill or you're lost, um, you can get up in the morning and in the same way that in Alcoholics Anonymous, they talk about one day at a time, you can get up every morning and say, just for today, I'm gonna to try to feel happy. I'm gonna look around at everything around me and say, oh my gosh, a bird built a nest in that tree, or gee, that woman looks like such a nice person. She has such a good smile on her face, or I love lemon meringue pie. <laughs> um, I just think, um, my own experience, and I always hesitate to sound Pollyannish, has been that you can choose. You can choose to look at all the good around you um, because there's a lot of it. And if you can't see that good, then all of the things that are happening around the world, all of the battles, all of the struggles, what are they for? Unless it's a good life, what's the point of fighting for it? Anna, before we started the interview off air, you and I were talking about um, politics and social issues, building some rapport off air. And I think it's fair to say we're not on the opposite ends of the political spectrum, but we're on different ends. And I told you off air, one of the things I most admire about you, our politics are different, is that I've always admired, maybe not your position on an issue, but I always admired the way you came to your position, the way you were able to articulate it in a way that made me think. Sometimes it moved me, sometimes it re-entrenched me in my own position. But I think it's a skill, it's a parenting skill, it's a friendship skill, it's a leadership skill, it's a relationship skill. Any final tips that you would impart to all of us as a remarkable literary icon and success on how each of us could better build a process to articulate and come to what our positions are so that we do deliver them in a way that is kind, perhaps in a way that gets well, other people to think or even change their mind? First of all, I think you just articulated that so well that we're not on opposite ends which suggests a kind of a battling. We're in different positions, and that's so important to remember. But I think one of the things that we've sometimes lost in this country, and some of it is because of the way we, we see positions described in the media and how people engage with them is, 
you have to listen. You have to listen to what people are really saying about how they feel and where they're coming from. And sometimes you listen to them and think, well, that's just misinformation. Yeah. Now, there are, there are a couple of ways to go about that. One is to say, are you crazy? That's nuts. That didn't happen. Or to say, have you read this piece about X? Or did you see the documentary about Y? I'm always sending links to people. Now, it, admittedly, I'm usually sending them to people who think much the same as I do. But occasionally, I, I say, no, no, let's, let's pass this along. And I do think it's so important to listen. Um, I, have to, I have to give a little bit of a shout out here to my friend Brett Stevens, who is a columnist for the New York Times. Brett and I politically are in, as you said, different places. But he so illustrated what we need to do in a recent long, long piece at, in the Times about climate change, where he talked about how he was approached by someone who said to him, a scientist who said, come take a trip with me to Greenland. Let me talk to you about what's going on. Now, Brett's conclusions about how to deal with climate change are in many ways very different from my own, but they were deeply researched and deeply reported and deeply felt in a way that made me think different but, but illuminating. And that's what I like to see more of, different but illuminating. Anna, I am privileged uh, to write a 10-volume series for HarperCollins called Master Mentors, where each year I pick certain guests and I feature them. And I might reach out to you some other time to see if you might be featured. But that's not my point. My point in writing these books is that I think a lot of us think of mentors as the CFO on the third floor or some vice president you know, in a different um, building that we're matched with. But I, I argue, argue it differently as I think some of our greatest mentors in life are people we've never met before. In fact, my greatest mentor in my life was a man named Bruce Williams. He actually led a radio program called TalkNet for many decades in the 80s and 90s. And I listened to him every night. He was sort of like, uh, you know, part businessman, part lawyer, part mayor, part entrepreneur. And I never met Bruce Williams. He doesn't know I even exist. He passed without knowing Scott Miller was even alive. But he had an incalculable influence on my life. And like him, so have you. I want to remind everybody that I think it's important to have mentors that you don't know, but you read, you learn, and you pick people also that are perhaps on opposite ends of the aisle or different ends of the aisle, and that you learn and it really presses on your own thinking, whether it's about how to be a better spouse or a better parent or a better neighbor or a better um, parishioner or leader or how to be led. Thank you for your, um, thanks for uh, not agreeing, but being a present mentor in my life for decades. Uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed all that you've written and I'm honored and humbled that you joined us today. Anna Quinlan, thank you for joining On Leadership. Thank you, Scott. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership. Yeah.